thank you. I appreciate the comments from the public record because I purchased a home this year and I went to some homes and I went down and my realtor pointed out to me that a couple of the homes we went down to the basements were refinished. His comment was to me, you better check with the town to find out if they got a permit to do that. Because if they did, you might have to tear it all apart and start fresh. And so I called and it was public record and was told that it was not done by a permit. The house I bought was done by a permit. So I think it's due diligence on the property buyer to try to figure out something looks amiss here when you're walking on around the back of the house. You've got to make some comments and make some inquiries and say, you know, something just doesn't look right here. If we want to try to do this, we need to find out if we can do it or not before you actually purchase the property. So I guess, do we have any letters or emails on this? I'll open it up to the public hearing. Anybody from the public wish to address this matter? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. You have a pretty definitive without us voting. Do you want us to vote on this? Yes. Okay. All right. We'll be through. Thank you. The land in question cannot yield a reasonable return. The land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. All in favor? One. Opposed? The voting line. Are you not in favor of one? Land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless variance is granted. We're doing the final vote. Okay. Not in favor. I won't change my vote. Okay. So it's unanimous as no. The need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. All in favor? Mr. Chair, do we need to go any further? Mr. Hawks, I said we should probably vote on it. I asked you to vote. We'll just do the vote. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. All in favor? Unanimous. In favor. The hardship is not the result of the action taken by the applicant prior owner. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Do we make a motion to deny or motion to approve? Application is presented. Do you have a second? Yes, you make the motion. I'll second. All in favor of the motion is presented. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Two minute break, please.
16 by 22 foot two story addition on the west side of the existing dwelling, about 32 feet from the front property line. The required front yard setback in the RF zone is 50 feet. The appellant requests an 18 foot variance. Thank you. No other staff comments. Anything? Could you just briefly give us an overview of what you're looking to do and then we'll go into questions. You can just read your answers in. Sure. Um, basically, what my wife and I would like to do is add an addition under the house. It's what's really solid, like Ryan said. Um, as time is on, I've owned the house since I was 24. Um, 2002. Over a period of time, I've done improvements to the house to make it a home. You know, I bought a house. Um, I've been in front of this one board many times. Um, the first time being the farmer's porch. Um, that was the hardest one to get through. Um, now my wife and I have a family. You know, my daughter is in third grade. Family's getting bigger. We're in a fairly small house. I don't want to move from where we're at. I like our location. Love the yard. It's a neighborhood that I grew up in, it's across the where I grew up, my parents still live there. Um, we'd like to be able to make a modest improvement to the house. I don't find it to be over the top or anything unreasonable. Um, I'd like to have the house be a little bit more up to date with some of the other current houses in the area that I currently live in. Just to also note, if you look at the uh, proposed addition, you'll see the farmer's porch is in the picture. Um, I dug my first time over in front of the zoning board of appeals to get the farmer's porch approved, which it was. Um, I also want you to see that I propose to keep the front of the addition two feet behind the existing front of the wall of the house. I have plenty of side setback. Uh, I'm not looking to encroach any further to the front. Then it's already there. So. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go down through the questions. Any of the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property, not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. You can just read in your answers if you have Yeah, uh, due to the fact that the setback requirement has changed since the house was built in 1961, the proposed addition will not meet setbacks. The addition we would like to build will actually set in two feet from the front of our house, so we'll not be altering our current setback. Granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have, have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of abutting properties. No, if anything, it would increase the value of the neighborhood. Thank you. Three, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. No, the request is due to the zoning changes made by the town since the house was built in 1961. The zoning has changed. Thank you. No feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Uh, due to the circumstances, uh, my driveway is on the easterly side. Um, there's a mudroom that I was approved to build uh, roughly 10 years ago. Uh, the garage is on the easterly side. Uh, directly behind my house is where my septic tank is. Um, I know when I spoke with Brian about um, putting together the paperwork for this meeting, he'd seen in the record. The people that I bought the house from had to replace the septic tank. It was a steel tank that needed to be replaced before they sold the house. There was a proposed new change to a raised bed leach field in the very way back corner, which I guess is still uh, recorded in the town hall, but that was not needed to be done. It did pass the perk test. They were able to hook the concrete tank to the existing leach field. So um, I know Brian and I have talked about that. I think he made a note about that, but uh, there's no need for that to be part of this discussion, but I can't go off the very back of my house because that's exactly where my second tank is. There is a picture there that Brian had me pull up off the uh, town map. You'll see it's highlighted in red right behind the house. That's where my second tank is, and the leach field follows directly behind. Granting of the variance will not result in bringing the applicant's property more than nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Well result. Five. Yeah, yeah. Um, all of the other houses in the neighborhood were built at the same time, so everybody in the neighborhood is not conforming. So um, I've, it's not going to change the fact that the house is not conforming. It's allowing something reasonably reasonable to be built and not affect my front side back anymore. Granting the variance will not have an unreasonable adverse effect on the natural environment. 
uh, no changes to the environment will occur. I guess one question I had when I was looking at this initially, mm -hmm. did you anticipate, because as you said, you've been four or seven times, did you anticipate any of these being like just one possible? If, if I had the financial wherewithal to said, you know, when I was 24, I want to have a house that looks just like this, I want to have a family's porch and a small mudroom and have a family, uh, I would have said, just let's get this all done once and for all. Um, unfortunately, that's not the way it works for me. I, I, I pay as I go. I uh, um, work hard, um, work hard here in town, and I'd like to be able to continue to work hard on my house. Most of the I do is, you know, myself. Obviously, I have professionals that will help with um, the construction part of it. But uh, it was not a situation where I could just say, "Hey, I want to do all these things." You know, you have six months to start, and you get to finish most of the time. I think on a building permit, and I would not. That would not have happened. So. And don't take that sarcastically either. The property is not located in whole or part within the shoreland zone as defined in 38 MRSA 435 or flood hazard zone as defined in the town of Scarlet's flood plan management ordinance. Nothing I'm aware of. Questions from the board? Mr. Place? Um, I really don't have any questions. Uh, the one thing that we, we were talking about was the septic tank mm -hmm. and the possibility of that being in the back corner of the property, but we clarified that. So basically, there's really no other place that you can really expand. I really don't have any problem with it. Yeah, I don't have any comments to it. Can make comments on it. The uh, toughest question on these kind of appeals for me is that there are no other feasible alternatives. So I'm going to ask some questions and it's going to help me paint a picture as to whether you've done your due diligence to make sure you've covered everything and reviewed everything possible. So, sure. uh, there's an area between the septic uh, and the septic fields in red on the aerial view, correct? Correct, yes. There's an area between the septic field and the garage, which is to the right in this view. And I don't know what that dimension is, but let's say it's 15 feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back towards the, what looks to be a round pool in the plan view. Correct. Um, did you consider trying to develop in that area so that you didn't have to move the septic, but you had some more room to deal with? The logistics of trying to get in behind the back of the house there um, would be very tough. Um, if you're looking down on the house, the right hand side, close to the garage, is a dining room kitchen. Bathroom's in the middle of the back, and then there's a, living, a small living room on the Washington side. <coughs> If we were to put the addition on the back, then to have a living room go up through the kitchen, it'd be completely destroying my kitchen. I've got no other spot. My, my sinks on the back wall, at the back window looking out, so I, it would completely be, um, in my opinion, unfeasible. And the bathroom's in board of that? In the, in yeah, I've got my, my kitchen, and then I've got my bathroom, and then the current living room. Yeah. Uh, what I'd like to have, uh, the, it'd be a full foundation storage underneath, living room, and a bedroom upstairs for my daughter. And that would create, would you say that that would be a normal shaped room that we'd create back there if you did that, or would that be an odd shaped room? It'd be very odd shaped room. Um, the, the current house is um, daylight basement in the back, so almost three stories in the back. Um, I went in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals to change the um, pitch of the roof of my garage from a 6 12 pitch to a 10 12 pitch, put trusses up there. So trying to tie in the roof of the garage and trying to tie in the roof of the addition with, with what's already there, it'd just be, a, I think, a, a logistical nightmare. Um, and like I said, trying to completely rehab my kitchen when it's not really necessary. If I go off the, end, the west from the end of the house, um, it would be a lot easier. I plan on having the roofs stepped out, the existing roofs so they can be tied in properly for, you know, uh, flashing water issues. I don't want to have the front of the house match and I don't want the back of the house to match because this is 
you know, trying to add on to a house 50 some odd years later, it's almost impossible. So I'd like to have it just be um, on the other, on the Washington side of the house. Okay, well, what about if you were to attempt to go, and I'm, gonna, I'm facing from the front, mm -hmm. the back right hand corner of the home, what if you try to connect to the garage and use the space of the garage, would that be an option for you? Uh, not really. Uh, if you look, um, there, I got approval for a small mudroom on the back of the uh, basement. Um, there's, there was not a full cellar door, so I built a small mudroom that's there, so I'd be destroying that as well. I'd rather leave that intact. I'd rather leave my garage separate and just go off the end of the house. Um, and I think it'd be the simplest, simplest way. Okay. And going from the right side of the house towards the garage and that space right to the front of the garage, uh, is that feasible or an option? Is there a that's, my, that's my driveway. Right. Yeah. So. Um, losing driveway, is that an option? Or? I, I don't lose my driveway, no. Okay. No, I mean, I got two garage doors there, and I'd be obviously blocking one of those, and then, you know, trying to go off that side of the house is already a mudroom that I built. I'd have to destroy that. Tied on garage. The garage isn't on a full, it's on a slab, so I would be, I, I would not think that would be the most feasible way to put an addition in my house. So. And my last question would be, with the leach field right off the back of the home, have you considered moving that backwards in to create a little bit of space on the back side of the home and then maybe extending the back three stories or two and a half stories backwards? Uh, the septic tank is extremely deep in the ground up back there. Okay. Um, going that route would be destroying the entire backyard that I've got. And then we'd probably run into an issue of damaging the, the current leach field, which would turn into having to have a ready bed way in the back corner. There'd be a lot more expense. I think Do you have an idea for what that expense is? I, it'd be probably $20,000. Okay. Yeah. All right, that answers my question. Yeah. Brian, did you receive any letters or emails on this? I'm just saying that, you know, the addition looks like it's very close to the neighbors and to their driveway. Did you speak to them? I know they received that, notice. That's, that's his problem. Is that? That's, those are all these problems. Those my, that's my lower driveway. Oh. Yeah, my house, I have a fairly big lot, but my house is, um, everything's on the southeast corner of the property. So I went up a drive that's paved, the garage, the house, the house is 24 by 32, it's a very modest cape in my opinion, it's not a big house. Um, I grew up in this town, and when I grew up in this town, every house was pretty modest, but there's a lot of bigger houses now. I don't really want to move, I love the property I've got, you know, I've got a lot of blood, sweat, and tears there, and um, I'd just like to simply improve on what I've got. So that lower driveway is mine as well, and there's two small sheds that I were able to place it by permit of the town. But they're two separate properties, is that true? No, it's all one property. Yeah. My property line is 150 feet on the front edge, 300, 300 feet deep. Uh, the only questions I've had coming into this uh, have been answered already, uh, just with regard to the septic tank and whether or not it's actually there or not. It's, it's clearly there and you're stating that it's currently working and it's fine. Um, then I have no further questions. What I was getting at when I asked you the question about coming before us for all at once brings me to the no other feasible alternative, but it also brings me to uh, where was it here? Number three, the practical difficulty is not a result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Some of the things you've added on or done are some of the things that you're saying that you don't want to lose. But that kind of brings me back to that because it was actually something that you did that now you don't want to lose if we were if you were able to just do this without coming before us. From the standpoint of every time I've done anything at the house in the past 15 years I've gone in front of the zoning board of appeals, I think this is number five. I wish I had, like I said, you know, before I wish I could have looked and said I want to do all these things and be able to get one approval from the zoning board of appeals. That's not the way it works. There was a substantial amount of money invested in coming to the door each time. Um, it's not the end of the world, a huge amount of money, but it's still you know, a fairly good amount. So for all the steps I've taken to try to do it the right way and have in the past been approved by the zoning board for these uh, requests, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to lose those. Right, and it's, that's my problem with it though, is number two is bringing me to number three. That there would have been a feasible alternative, but you did do the other action, so that's what I'm struggling with for these here when, okay. when I look at this. Um, okay, 
Great, thank you for all your information. Thank you. One, the need of the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property, not the general conditions of the neighborhood. Definitely. Yes, I would agree. The property is built in 1961. I'm sure the roads are a lot narrower back then.
for no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. I agree with this answer. I believe the applicant has shown due diligence in reviewing all the options that he had for design and, uh, and agree that he has, this is the most feasible alternative. I agree. I think you've done a good job at demonstrating this is what you got. Thank you. The applicant has shown that he can't build on the plan view east side of the building in front of his garage. He can't go back behind his house because the septic tank is there. Um, and if you were, like Mr. Longstaff mentioned, try to build off into the build of Wapolo, you then would not be, uh, um, you would be altering the character of the neighborhood of houses because you'd have a 45 degree angle addition of your home. So, and your long hallway off the back. It's a very, very long hallway indeed. No, but this is one that I always say no on. But based upon the fact that I said no on three, kind of leads me to four being there is no feasible alternative because of what you've done. At this point, there is no other feasible alternative other than what you're trying to do in my mind based upon that fact, so I would be fine with that. All in favor of four? Unanimous. Five, the granting of variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding property. Seeing all the other properties in the area are non-conforming, this isn't going to make any changes to anything, so I agree with this answer. I believe that uh, if he changed and went to a different alternative, that it would be less in compliance with what it is uh, today. So under this design, he did what he could do to minimize the impact to side, front, and rear setbacks. I think Mr. Loisel pretty much summed it up there. I agree. And the key word being, you know, minimizing the non-conformance. You know, you indicated that you, the front of your house is going to be two feet back from the road to try to, you know, accommodate as best as you can. So. Yes, I'd say on this one, I, I think that you've demonstrated that the other properties are non conformance Like I said, I can't verify that. That's based upon what you're telling us. And Mr. Longstaff's also given us information on that. So based upon his information that he gave us about the property and what you've given us and just not here and looking at it, I think that is correct. All in favor of 5B, men? Unanimous. Six, granting of a variance will not have an unreasonable and best adverse effect on the natural environment. Right. I agree. I trust the applicant, but there will be no adverse effects. I agree. I would agree. I think the adverse effects may be if you were doing something else and you had to move that leach field or you had to move that septic system, you may have some adverse effects on the environment based on doing that after it's been for a while. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's that'd be a very huge undertaking to move the septic system. All in favor of six being met? Unanimous. Seven, the property is not located in part, hope in whole or in part within the shoreland area is defined in the 38 uh, SA 135 or flood hazard zone is defined in the Tetler of Scarborough's flood plan, flood plan management ordinance. I don't know if we go down through this. Like that's pretty self explanatory. All, yeah, all in favor of 7 the amendment? We have a motion on the appeal number 2633. I'll move to approve appeal. Oh. practical difficulty, you also have to make a finding on the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which variance is sought, would both preclude the use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. Thank you. I'm going to get fired for my job. Okay, so the dimensional standards, those provisions of the ordinance which relate to the lot area, the lot coverage, frontage, and setback requirements. In case of a strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance of the property for which a variance is sought, would both preclude a use of the property in which the permitted is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. Well, <coughs> I, excuse me, I agree. Um, 
moving the septic system would have a major impact to the cost. And I say your estimate was probably a little bit low from, uh, from what I would foresee. So I agree. I agree. In addition to the septic, um, other options we explored going over to the driveway, destroying the mudroom on the back side of the house. If you, you did move the septic tank, you're removing all the plumbing for the kitchen fixtures and the, the lavatories and all that. Um, so, yeah, it's certainly a very severe economic injury. Just simply add, Mr. Chairman, if you, again, if you look at the site plan with the buildable envelope, um, he'd still probably have to come back for a few. For a variance, you would put an addition on the back of the structure. Thank you for that clarification. Um, yeah, I think you've demonstrated based upon the septic system as to what you'd have to incur an additional cost and what you'd have to incur an additional cost for moving things and, and moving things that have been built to other areas of demo. demo and I would agree on that. All in favor of B1 and 2? Shenanigans. All in favor of appeal number 2633 is presented. Four. One opposed. Thank you, Ross. Have a good day. Thank you. Equipment that I won't be using anymore from 
the site, clean up the site, uh, put a fence up to put my sawmill behind the fence. Uh, I talked to a landscaper about landscaping or around it to make it an attractive place to have people come in. It would be nice to have a sign too. But, then, but basically what I want to do is I just, I want to clean it up in the front half of the property. Uh, I'm not looking to add any great traffic to it. If I start getting the volume that can't handle it, I'm going to be looking for another site. Great. We'll go down through the questions. If you could just answer your answers as you presented them. <coughs> the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal emissions to the air, water, or other aspects of its design or operation. We're not doing any manufacturing. Um, we're not adding any uh, any plumbing fixtures at all. Thank you. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Uh, it's, it's 114. I mean, there's a lot of traffic on 114. I don't foresee me adding to it. Based on that, do you have a turnaround of the property where people can make so you're I, do. I, I, do. I have uh, I have ample parking and I, and I have a place to turn around on site, yes. Thank you. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. As I stated, I've got a veterinary hospital on one side of me and I've got a golf course on the other. And I've got a development going in across the golf course. D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Uh, there again, it's just displays without doing any, uh, any work on site. Do you have a couple of paths out there now by the road? Um, I have a display that is 50 feet back, and I have another display. I have three extra displays on, on property at the moment. They're mostly out by the road, though, right? Uh, no. I know I've driven by a couple times and seen right. some that are fairly close. Yeah. E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. So we're not going to really add anything more there. We're just going to rearrange and reconfigure what we have. Thank you. Now, if located in a shoreland zone as depicted on the town of Scarborough's official shoreland zoning map, the proposed use will comply with all the requirements of the town of Scarborough shoreland zoning ordinance. We're not, we're not sure about that. Thank you. The applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Uh, we bought the property in, in uh, 99. Uh, so you know, we own the property. We, we have plenty of uh, equity there. And that is part of your package as well, your tax bill. Okay. The tax bill is always in here. Yeah. The applicant has technical and financial ability to meet the standards of the section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. There again, been a contract for 40 years. I don't think you can tell me anything that can't get done. Okay. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with, with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operations. Uh, it's <coughs> basically daylight hours, um, and there's no noise because there's, there's no work going on. By daylight hours, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, probably, I mean, no one's gonna, gonna visit it between, I would say, between 8 and uh, 6. Okay, thank you. We need to questions now as well, or we can take these separately. Come on, finish this. Yes. I'm not sure if this applies to a certain area. How many businesses are you running from your home currently? Just one. Just one? And which one is that? My uh, uh, remodeling contractor. The Sunrise Home? You're right. Okay, thank you. Was that something that you went forward to get? No, because I, I, you know, I, I never have, I don't have a dedicated space for Sunrise. Um, and I don't have any signage, so I didn't try for a, a home occupation because none of the work is done on site. Right. Okay. And I guess that's allowed, Brian. I don't know. As long as you don't have signs. Okay. And... When that will. Okay. I'll wait. Question. Okay. We 
do need to go to the performance standards for home occupations as well, which you don't probably have answered to. You can just answer the questions if you could. Okay. Uh, the occupation of profession shall be carried on wholly within the principal building or within a building accessory thereto. So I'll have, I have to the displays and what my post I think I probably left off that was to, was to utilize the, this, the existing greenhouse slab to put the showroom there, to construct the building for the showroom there. How big is the slab? Uh, the slab is, is about 380. It's uh, 16 by 24, so it's 386 square feet. Thank you. The home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. The home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. Yeah, there, there, there is several locations. No more than one person who is non-resident of the dwelling unit shall be employed in the home occupation. That's correct. Exterior signage shall be permitted in accordance with the home occupation sign provisions under section 12 sign regulation subsection E. So you were asking about a sign. I yeah, that's like, it's there. like two foot by three foot. There shall be no exterior display, no exterior storage of materials, and no other exterior indication of the home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal building, except as expressly permitted by the district regulations of this ordinance. This prohibition shall not apply to the storage of lobster traps, which you don't have any belief. What's that? You don't have any lobster traps? No. No, <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't know. <laughs> Um, no nuisance shall be generated, including but not necessarily limited to offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, odors, heat, or glare. No. Do you have a sawmill there? I do. That would be addressing any of those? No, the sawmill's a hobby. The sawmill's not, it's not used all the time. So it's not in relation to this business at all? Not at all. Uh, the traffic generated by such home occupation shall not increase the volume of traffic so as to create a traffic hazard or disturb the residential character of the immediate neighborhood. I, I don't foresee a lot of traffic. Thank you. In addition to the off-street parking provided to meet the normal requirements of the dwelling, adequate off-street parking shall be provided for the vehicles of each employee and the vehicles of the maximum number of users or customers the home occupation may attract during peak operation hours. How many people do you think would be there at any given time? One couple and myself. The home occupation may utilize not more than 20% of the dwelling unit floor area provided that for the purposes of this calculation, unfinished basement and basement and attic spaces are not included. So we're not we're not using any pine out of the model. Okay. Uh, space within an accessory building totaling not more than 1,000 square feet per area. So the, the space that I want to use is uh, under 400 square feet. Okay. Is that include displays? No, I'm sorry. Huh? No, it doesn't include displays. How much total space? Are displays are 12 by 14. And there's? Yes. Just two? Yes. Home occupations may include retail sales subject to the following limitations. Total area devoted to the retail sales is limited to 400 square feet and must be fully enclosed within a building. So that's what I'm proposing that to use a slab the greenhouse is on for that building, for that purpose. The sale of products is limited to products and articles produced, assembled, or processed on the premises seafood caught or harvested off the premises by the person who reside in the dwelling unit or by the one employee permitted under paragraph 3 above. So are you producing the products and assembling them there? No. The products are actually made in Canada, they're shipped today, and then they're put together at the customer's house. So everything's assembled off-site at the customer's Correct. house? Okay. So nothing's assembled on property at all? Correct. Okay. Anything processed on property? No. Storing before installation. I'm sorry, storage before installation. So um, if it's going to a customer site, you do a direct ship to them, or does it come to your property first and sit for a week before it goes? It, it comes to me. Okay. So what I rearrange in the existing buildings I have to accommodate that. 
none of the existing business buildings are going to be in direct relation to this business. No. Sawmill or any other buildings that are no. on premises aren't going to be supporting this business. Correct. Okay. You're not a fisherman or lobsterman, correct? Correct. I don't think we need to address a lot of And you're not doing motor vehicle repairs or towing? Correct. I think we covered everything. Thank you. Um, so, forgive me if this is a bit 
mentioned already, I'm just trying to grasp, uh, grab everything out here. So the existing greenhouse here, this is 18 by 38 approximately. That's going to be the location of the new showroom? Correct. Okay. And then adjacent to it, you have two 12 by 14 displays? Correct. Okay. And those will be the, um, I guess, the only buildings there for the home occupation? Correct. Okay. Um, Okay, I think that's all I have right now. And what was the total square footage that needs to be under? It's about 1,000. 1,000 cumulative? Square foot for the biggest problem. It's one accessory. And 400 feet. 1,000 square feet is what it says uh, for a space with an accessory building, not more than 1,000 square feet of floor area. If you're doing retail sales, which I would assume would be the sales office part of your building, it's limited to 400 square feet. That's of that 1,000 can be 400 square feet. So if there's two 12 by 12s, that's 336 square feet. My math is right. I think we just added up with the dimensions that came to 684 as well. Okay. Um, just one more thing. I don't know if the board. <laughs> I'm kind of curious as to, to the um, number five under the home occupations where it says there shall be no exterior display, no exterior storage of materials. Does the board consider the display units as not displays? <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's, that something. We, we want to address the 684 square feet because right now that's what we're looking at. That's what you have right at the moment. What size building is going on the pad? The pad's 18 by 38, is that correct? Right, the, the, the showroom would be on the 14 by 18. And then there'd be an office behind that, which is on the uh, 16 by 24. So the display, the showroom would be less than 400. It's 256 square feet, I think. No, they are, it's all one big slab. Are they going to be connected when you put it on? They will be connected, yes. Okay, so you're going to be open. The display, the, the show will be up behind there. Right. But, uh, but the office the back will be on the same slab. But they're going to be connected, so we're looking at it for the whole square footage. Right. So we're looking at it more like 636. As Correct. And I just, had, I just had a question because it seems like you've got a couple of occupations on there. Did we have anything before? This that had that home occupation is there, or was it not required before? There was no home occupation permit. There was no home occupation permit before, but it's not unlike a number of contractors who operate on their truck and live at home and keep materials there. Is it a violation? I don't know, it's a question, but the sunrooms where they're not affixed to the ground. Um, and there was no signage. Um, could, could technically couldn't tell they were for sale. Although somebody told me if you put anything in your front yard on a trailer, it's for sale. It may. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true or not. I had somebody take my canoe once. They thought it was, they thought it was for free. Um, so I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a question. But there, there was no home occupation permit there. He's coming in to apply for that now. So. I, I don't know what else to say but that. Mr. Chair, uh, typical standard practice, we normally have a drawing that has things marked on it so we can see what's going in. I don't feel like we have that right now. Can we either create that document here or do we have to have him come back and bring it? Just a form, yes. Okay. Anybody else have that? I mean, it's a little bit, and, and I apologize, but it's a little bit unclear to me where the final situation of everything is going to be going there on, on the drawing, and uh, I would like to see just a more finalized plan of exactly where everything's going with um, square footage is listed out. Yeah, I think when, when we have things like this, what we like to see is some pictures and some more defined drawings, and uh, I have one display here. I hear that one of the, well, we're looking for the property and what it's going to look like. 
Okay. Like if you can give us some type well, of idea of what we're looking at. I mean, we don't want to just approve something and not know what we're approving. Which right now we don't really know. There's so many moving parts on this property that you've got five or six different things and it's hard to really tell what we're looking at because it's not clearly defined. I mean, we can, we can continue or... What's your thought on that? Uh, if the applicant is open to it, would you consider coming back to us with information that shows exactly well, where you're part, of, part of the problem right now is taking a picture right now wouldn't do it justice because I've kind of torn things apart trying to put things back together. Um, and I still have to finish cleaning up the logs and put a fence up and move stuff around. So what you saw now would... But is there a more defined plan even? Yeah, can you clearly mark this out to scale? Because that's really what... Yeah. Could you clearly mark your thoughts out to scale so we can actually tell exactly what you're doing? Because in good faith, we can't approve something without knowing what it is. And until we see it on paper to scale, then it's just guesswork. That is not to scale. Right. Yeah. And it's it needs to be well defined so we know where the new buildings are going to be located, their shape, their position. And right now, it's it's basically a little sketch, and it really needs to be. Not that it has to be an engineer drawing, but if it was drawn up to scale, hard lines so it's clear as to where all the buildings are, where everything's going to sit, that certainly would help us. So if I, if I if I drew a scale of 114 and this this front half of the property showing where the displays would be and the show would be, that's what you're looking for. Correct, and where people might park. You don't need the whole property. No, just, no, no. Okay. Just that. Well, it's affected by what you want to do with this development. Yep. Yeah, I like, I like the idea of actually having you come back with a scale drawing draft of what you're intending to do and maybe something that, that indicates, you know, what are what are part of the properties that are fixed to land versus what are just the free-floating displays that you're going to have, um, you know, what things are changing about the property, perhaps a little bit, you know, from my perspective, a, a little bit of what exists now that you're removing versus, you know, so what the, what the look is now versus what it will be um, to see the, the actual change. I think I'm, I myself would like to see more as well. I mean, I'd like to have more information on the logs. I mean, generally when you're having logs like that on your property for your sawmill, it's either an occupation if you're having them drop there or you can harvest your own land use your own trees and things like that, but we really need to see specifically what you're going to be doing with what you're asking us for here, and then some other things with the property that we just can clean up so that we make sure we've got this all squared away for you, so we make sure we know exactly what we're looking at, because you got a lot of moving parts over there right now. I mean, we can continue and go down through all the questions for you, or we can table it. I mean, if we get to the point where we deny it, you'd have to wait one year to come back, uh, if you want to table it, come back with more information, we can certainly do that. We can hear it. It'll be the first appeal. The next one, is that correct? Yeah, if you wanted to come back next month, it would be the first appeal we hear, so you wouldn't be having to wait. So I, I guess it would be in my best interest to table it and do a more scale of what sunspace is taking up on the property. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to see my own personal stuff. I'd like to see what's going on with the other stuff, too. too. That's just my own personal what the stuff we're talking about the like the logging is yeah I think the other the other questions in my mind are regarding the, the home based business aspect of this or, or the uh, which and just seeing how how those questions come into play and having a little bit more specific information right in front of us that we could look at that would explain which you know what the what the businesses are that are going on in the property. Maybe you can explain that a little bit better than I may have about the logs. I don't know. Is it is it specific that it has to be if you if you've got logs on the property and you're using sawmill for things, you've got to be using your own trees and land to be doing that. <laughs> yeah, commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, under commercial activity, 
um, commercial forestry, he's saying it's, it's, it's a hobby, so it's a little bit different. Uh, if he's not selling logs for money, then it's a hobby versus commercial activity. I think what wasn't clear, and, and Ken may be able to, I mean, I think he has alluded to the fact that it's a hobby, you're not selling logs, you're not selling lumber for people for money. No. So it's not commercial. Yeah. I mean, it's not a commercial sawmill. Yeah. You, it's an allowed use in the RF. A commercial sawmill is an allowed use in the RF as an accessory use. Or, or not, even even as a principal use, it's allowed. However, you're supposed to be sawing up logs that you take off your property for commercial. If it's if it's a, a hobby and people are bringing logs to you and you're sawing it because you like to you like the noise, you like the sawdust, and you, you want to use the equipment. That's like you say some people play golf. You like to saw logs, so uh, each to his own. I, I don't think that that necessarily then violates that condition uh, because he's not making money from doing that. Thank you. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, if I could just add. Yeah. Along with that, what, what you do with your logs, how you store them, how you stack them, it's not pertinent to this application. This is about this particular property for these uh, displays and this. Uh, building but uh, your showroom or whatever you call it uh, it really is around that layout so if you could focus on this front portion of the property where that existing building is to the road and scale that in and show dimensions to the property lines that would be really beneficial and again look I think we need to keep focused on what's pertinent to this application not that you have 15 other businesses that's not you're not applying for those now it doesn't, in my opinion, apply to this application. So let's keep it just to the, those specific items. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I can just add, I think first I was I was answering his his question about whether commercial sawmills are a thing, and I was just describing that. It wasn't a, it wasn't pointed at you know anything to do with this application. It was simply answering the question. Um, the other thing, and as far as the activity, only in, as much as it may impact how people are getting in and out of the property, if you've got a lot of other stuff going on and is it safe access and that kind of thing. Sure. I agree, I 100% I agree that you really need to look at this application and this, this proposal, but I think given the, given the amount of activity on that, it's still a concern certainly describe how that's all going to work together, I think that's not a problem. So I think I heard you say you'd like to table it? Yes. Okay. I have a motion to table the appeal. Move to table. So right. Second. All in favor of tabling? It's unanimous. Oh, one month would be enough time for you to come back. Yep. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mr. Chair? Yes. Can we offer up the uh, planning department if he needs some help with to, what to document for us? I would think uh, Mr. Longstaff is willing to help you in what we need to make a decision. Is that something that's possible? Does that sound good? Okay? Yep. We're all the resources. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. In your packets, I think everybody got, hopefully everybody got this. Ms. Shoot, you had asked for it. Um, you're going to get beach character based zoning districts. So does everyone have that? It's like this right here. that in the history of us, I've been involved in a couple of cases that have gone to court. 
And my question is, is if we wait and document what comes from that meeting, and we don't use the videotape as the prima facie evidence, prima facie evidence, my fear is that we're going to do our best to capture the information or the thought behind it in written form, but we may not be able to capture all of it. And I think it's been proven in a couple of cases that have gone to legal review that they actually go to the videotape, and that is the document that they rely on to find out what was said and what the intent behind that was. And I remember some of the writings coming back from the judge in having us re-review that he kept going back to the video, not to written form. So my fear is if we're relying on the written form and waiting to sign on that, that it kind of takes away the value of the video. And I think the judges are going to more rely on the video than they are the written form. So the only fear for me is waiting and documenting. It puts a lot of onus on the planning department to really get the thought behind it, not just what was verbally said. You've got to get the intent behind it. So my fear of waiting is that we'll lose that intent. And if it ever goes to legal judgment, then that written document will be the primary document and we might not capture it all. So that, that was really my thought on it, right? wanting to comment. Me first. Um, I have the mic. Um, there was one, I, I will say there was one instance earlier this year um, before you came back on, Rick, where there was a court judgment that came back to us um, and they didn't, they based it solely on the written uh, information that was provided to them, they didn't watch the video. Okay. Yeah. They, they did not. That's rare, actually. Yeah, yeah. The one case I'm referring to was the Scarborough Beach extension. Remember when they looked at expanding at that? I remember the judge coming back and saying, and I looked at the video and heard the people talking because there were tons of people from the audience that had input, and they went back to that video, I believe. The judge watched the seven hours that day. It was huge. So. I mean, I can, I can see with like something that to scale, the judge probably would spend the time to do it. But from the past ones that we that I've seen it with, with that one that came back, it was it's just a limited group of people involved, and the judge didn't um, review the video or the audio or any of that. Based it, he or she based it solely on the written information that was provided. If I recall, if I recollect that correctly. And I think we're, we're trying to go more to me municipal standards and stuff as to what they're doing, and that's why we're doing some of this, but Mr. Long's going to definitely address it a little bit more than I can. Or, anybody else have any comments on that? Yeah, um, and I appreciate your comments, Rick. Um, and well, well, well uh, said and well, well thought. I actually have the opposite reason. You, you're worried about the intent getting lost. I'm worried about the intent getting captured. I feel that sometimes the board circles the circles the animal, but they never quite get there. And and what my hope is is that you know, in a court, a court, who knows? A judge could look at it any any which way. And he certainly is not required to only look at the written decision. He can look at the video. They can shoot. They can look at the video if they want. Um, but. But they oftentimes will first look to see if you did findings and conclusions. And again, ask any any attorney in the state that represents a municipality, almost every one of them is likely to say that the hardest thing for any board of appeals to do is to do the findings and the conclusions in a way that you know is adequate for a, an attorney or a judge to draw from that. The legal basis for what they did. It's a hard thing to do on the fly here at the meeting. And the discussion is all good, and I don't mean to say that it isn't, and I don't mean to say that your questions aren't good or, or anything, but in actually coming up with, as you go down through each of the criteria, it's the proper way would be to say, okay, so first finding the fact, um, the applicant has owned this property since 1972. The property is in the RS zone. So. The property was built before zoning. Um, you know, you can state those things, and then from that, you can draw a conclusion, hopefully, that, that supports your vote the way that you voted. And it's a really hard thing to do. It's not easy for any Board of Appeals. It's not even easy for folks that work with it all the time, and even lawyers. But where the, I talked to our town attorney, and he 
he said that this really is the best. Not it's not the only way. It's it's a really good way to do it. And it's we're not putting words in your mouth because we're relying on the audio and video record to draw that information out, as well as the application and the things that have been submitted in the application. So it's coming from all different sources to get on paper as a written decision. It's just really hard to do on the spot. We've been getting by with it. No question we've been getting by with it. But I think one of the reasons that the judge would go to the video is because he's not seeing anything on the written decision that tells him anything, right. you know, or her. So I think this helps that. They, they may do some fact checking, and that's why it's important for us to stay honest and true uh, to what was said. And, and, and it's sometimes, I mean, I've got to be honest with you, I spent a long, you're right, it's, it's, a, it's a commitment of time to do, to do that. Plus, I have to watch all of us on video, which is so painful. Um, except Leroy, he looks fantastic all the time. But, but it's so, sometimes it's very difficult to actually come up with anything from all of the back and forth, it's not even, it never quite gets there, you know what I mean? So I'm hoping to try to stay true and not just pull words out of thin air, but also hoping to try to capture the essence of what I think the board was actually getting at that makes sense in the context of the, the whole case. So I mean, I'm sorry to ramble on, but it, I, I appreciate it, uh, and as well as the change that with this written decision, on our attorney's advice, it's not necessary, nor is it even all that common that the whole board has to sign that written decision. The chairman can sign just like he signs the letter that goes to the appellant, and just like he, he's the only one that signs the, the certificate of, I think, the certificate as well. The chairman's the only one that signs that. So it, the board takes the vote, the record is there, we record the number of votes for, the number of votes against. So it's all there. Plus, we know who was there because we take the attendance at the meeting. So it's not like you guys aren't important and you don't need to sign your name, but it just speeds up the process a little bit, too. It makes it a little easier to gather those signatures in those cases where I think we had to have some people come in and sign one time. It's really hard to round everybody up. Everybody's busy. So for all of those reasons, and basically because our lawyer recommended it, that's the way. And I just thought it was a good time to do that. It all it coincided with the administrative appeal that we had earlier this year, the, the, the change in, in chairman, and, and, and again, nothing against the former chairman, this just seemed like a good time to incorporate some of these changes where new, new blood, new, new uh, way of doing things, and if at any time anything is not settling well with the board, your chairman is your voice and he gives us direction, unless it's illegal, unless it's ill-founded, Ill we would certainly go to whatever the board wants to do. He figured he'd just change everything up for me. I think it's totally confusing as he could when I took over. And my intent was not to change the decision that was made. I just wasn't here for the meeting, and I couldn't see it in the notes where what happened, so that's really why I just wanted to ask the question. And I think we do have two sets now, because what Mr. Longstaff's trying to do as we go through the meeting is he's trying to write down what we've said and he's got sh on his sheets where he's putting the findings of fact in there for us and the conclusions and Karen's also going back to the video and taking notes as well so we have the notes, we have the video, we have what he's writing down as well so we kind of have three different things now which backs us up even more because we've got three different entities where we're actually seeing the stuff written going back to the video, the notes and everything so yeah, sure. it just wanted to make it as confusing as he could for me. And I'm going to say this off the of I just know I blather on so much that it's got to be difficult for these guys to pick up. So, so this is kind of my, my cheat sheet. I've made lines under each one so I can jot down comments as they happen and I can record the yeah, votes. And then if it's not, if, if it's a very simple one, we could use, we could use this um, if it's a very uncomplicated one. Um, but most of the time, or, or, or when it's not, I would prefer to go back and meet this up and type it out and have it you know, back for, for a signature later. But the decision still stands the night that you were, and that's so the appellant walks away with the decision, um, and Karen sends out the requisite paperwork. Um, this is just for the record, basically. Yeah, good. Thank you. Please keep your last appeal to 
in your folders. Well, I want to say something. Just to follow up what Brian said, you signed a copy, a page with lines on it, but you never saw what was put in there. Right. So this way gives you the opportunity to look in, in like tonight, Karen made a, an amendment. So you're now going to see that, and then that also helps Brian and I. So if the attorney does ask for it, we captured it correctly. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts with this, and, and the minutes may be a little more, bit more limited because we have that, and that is on file. Um, unless you guys want all of those every single time they answer a the question put in there. Um, I think Brian and I kind of talked about right. how to try to capture it's that. It's impossible to capture it. Yeah. So we just try to encapsulate what, right. what the discussion is. Why do you notice to come refer to me? And also, I think Leroy just said if you could keep your tabled item inside your black binder and the rest of it on top, I can, that way you can recycle it. Just from the yes, thing that made, you know, the onerous is always on us to check it to make sure that it's accurate. But, um, welcome, Melinda. I think you did an awesome job tonight, so thanks. That was awesome. Yeah, I second that. <laughs> yes, and I appreciate having a, a full board. It's, it's great to have every position filled because there are times when people have to travel and do things that we need every body that we can get. One of the applicants came up to me after the meeting last month and said he almost didn't do it because he saw four. And he knew if it was a 2 2 tie, it failed. But they stuck with it and it did pass for them. But that's the tough part when you've only got four people. Thank you all. Um, motion to adjourn. Are there any other comments? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you, everyone.